is de Twentwatcher des Vaderlands, Ajit Bakas. Ajit Bakas, you are number one trend watcher in Netherlands. The Prime Minister of Netherlands, His Excellency Mark Rutte, says about you that you are one of the most colorful and inspirational men that I know. Well, I, um, I am doing this world of work of trend fiction for about 30 years now, uh, because I'm an ancient man, uh, I'm, I'm 57 now, and uh, I studied communications at the university in the Utrecht here, not far from Amsterdam. And at first I had to communicate messages that other people thought of. And later I thought, what is really what I'm doing? And I wanted to get more into what the, 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 the message was. And then I started to, to, to focus on that and some people helped me with that. So there was... Uh, some people who helped me and educated me in how to try to guess it. And they, what they discovered is that I have a very good intuition. I have a very good intuition to grab, there's a lot of knowledge that is in the air everywhere around us. And uh, there is this, uh, this theory of quantum, uh, uh, the, the quantum uh, mechanics. That theory says that there is a lot of knowledge in the air, it's traveling through walls, through, through the air, everywhere. And you have to, and if you're able to grasp it, then you know quite a lot of what is going on. For example, when you're working on a crossword puzzle, don't try to solve it immediately. Do it after a day or three when a lot of people who have solved it good, their knowledge is in the air. And when you're able to tap that, you will always have it good. So that is a bit how it works. And uh, I... Um, I'm able to do that, but of course I have uh, in, an, an information network from all over the world. People, universities, companies who sent me research, reviews, everything, studies. And I make a combination of what my intuition says and what I'm grabbing out of the air and with all the scientific knowledge that I'm uh, getting. And, and all of this I mix in my books and my lectures. and. Uh, and people like that because I do it in a way that is, I call it more like infotainment. So I bring it with also in with small video clips. And what I also know is that when people laugh, that the, the message that they give after they had a good laugh, that stays with them for years. So I also try to make it a bit funny as well. You're a cosmopolite. You have roots from every corner of the world. How is it influencing you as a person? Well, uh, I'm, I'm Dutch. I'm really, really totally Dutch. I live here for 30 years uh, now and this is my country. But my, uh, I was born in a Dutch colony in Latin America. It's called Suriname. In the old days it was called Dutch Guyana. It's north of Brazil. It's a very small country. But my family originates from India. So they moved, they migrated from India to there. So I'm I have a portable identity. I'm a little bit Indian, I'm a little bit Latino, I'm a little bit Dutch, I'm a little bit everything. So that's why I feel at home everywhere. I feel at home everywhere in the world and I don't have to... And I understand lots of different cultures and different codes and so on. And I love it. I love it to be a global citizen. You are from Suriname, Mr. Bakas. But originally your ancestors come from India, as you says. How do you feel connected or do you feel still connected to that beautiful country? Uh, uh, yeah, of course, but it is. Uh, but uh, but this is this is my this is the country where I'm. This is my homeland. But of course, I still feel connected to India and Suriname. Of course, of course, I do. Mr. Bakas, you sold more than one million books. Please tell us what your books are about. My books are about the future, about what is happening today behind today's headlines in the newspapers, what is happening there and how it is going to influence our lives in the near future. How many books became bestsellers? Well, I, I don't know the titles anymore, but in, I don't just know the total number. That's one million and that's fine. They have been translated in different languages like Chinese and, uh, and I don't even know how many sold in China. So, The last book, The Age of Chaos, what it is about? Chaos, in, in modern day we think chaos, chaotic is that it is a mess. 
but the old Greek word of chaos of thousands of years ago means the big empty space, a big empty space in which everything moves from left to right, up to down, everything moves. And this is a, way, a, a, a period of disorder. And after that, the old order goes and a new order is being born. And after this, this age of chaos, I think we're going to get a new renaissance. But in Europe, we had ages of chaos before. For example, in the 15th century, have a look at the Italian city of Florence. Florence at that time, half of the population was wiped out because of the pest or the, uh, the how do you say it in, uh, we say it in Dutch, the pest, the, the, um, the plague. Half of the population of Florence at that time was wiped out because of the plague. That was the corona of that time, but people died of it. And at the same time, Florence became the main center of innovation and renewal all over Europe and started the new Renaissance, the Renaissance at that time. So chaos is good in I, some way. It is good. I think it's good. Here in the Netherlands, people who are not vaccinated may not be welcome to the restaurants and other public places. What will happen if the society will be divided into different groups? Well, in Asia is already the case, in France, in Italy, in Belgium, it's already the case. In, uh, in, in China, they call it, whenever you have, you, uh, you have been uh, vaccinated or you have had corona before, and then you, so you have, uh, uh, you're immune to it. So whenever you've had it, your phone lights up green. And whenever you, you're not, you don't have that, not vaccinated and no, uh, then your phone lights up red. So in Asia we call that the green and the red people. And the same is going to happen in Europe and in America. We will see the green and the red people. And the green people can do everything, can go everywhere. And the red people have to be tested everywhere and they have to pay for it themselves. So because of all that hassle, a lot of them choose to be vaccinated after all. And so in the end, there will only be green people. What is your prediction of a traveling industry? Well, I definitely think that we are going to travel again. Because yes, of course we can do meetings through Zoom or other video calls. Of course we can do that. And of course not for every small meeting you're going to take the plane or the train or the car. So I think we're going to see a hybrid world. So for a lot of things we're going to do that. But people are going to start traveling again. The tourists, the tourists are already taking the plane, uh, boarding the planes in Europe and also in America and Asia as well. People will do it again because the main reason why people travel according to a study of uh, Airbus, the, the manufacturing company of planes here in Europe, according to a study of Airbus, the main reason why people travel is visiting family and friends. And in the old days, your family and friends were in your village. But now, due to globalization, you have your family and friends all over the world. So that's the, the main reason why we travel. The second reason is tourism. Of course, when the weather is bad, you want to go to a sunnier place. And of course, you will do that. And when it's too hot there, like for example now, uh, in, the, in the Canary Islands with this volcano, which is uh, causing a lot of heat and uh, dust, then you don't want to be there and then you want to go to somewhere else. And um, so, of course, I, uh, people will want to do that again. And also for business, if you really want to close a deal, you have to do it physically. So, and when, people, when business people start to lose deals because their competitors do take the plane and they prefer to do it on video, then they are going to take the plane again as well. So I think that in business classes, it will take a bit more, more time, so maybe five years from now before the business class sees and the planes will be full, totally filled again. Most of your books about economical predictions. How do you find trends to predict? Well, um, some things are... Some things you can find... Um, uh, some things are just as coming, uh, coming to you and some things uh, people tell you some, and you make a combination of things that people tell you. For example, I had to lecture for the, the Nordic 
the, the, the Nordic airports, the airports in the Nordics and the Baltic states, and we were brainstorming about the future of travel. And then one of the IT guys that I worked together with said, look, but we can we have a look at what, is, what augmented reality is going to do. For example, with augmented reality, you can project on your window views from other cities of other destinations. So we are now, example, here in Amsterdam. But let's see, it's raining today and I want to I project the uh, sunny side from an Italian city out on the, on the window and then it looks like I'm there. But of course I'm not there, but of course it already makes me feel a little bit better about the rain. And uh, these things are going to happen and augmented reality is going to become better and better. And so, uh, so probably in the future for people who don't have money to travel, or who are scared to travel because they're afraid of terrorism or of diseases or of new pandemics. They can just project different views of different destinations on their windows, probably even project some things in, in their house. And if you want to feel Italian, then you order Italian food that is coming in, so you smell the smells of Italy and you have on your windows the views of an Italian city. If you want to feel uh, Nordic, then you have a views of, of, of the, of the, of the of uh, Oslo or of one of the fjords in Norway, and then you order some uh, with, with the restaurant, you order some Norwegian food, and then you feel Norwegian, and you feel like you're there. So that might be able to do, and you can also get bottles with getting the air, uh, with spraying the, su the, the, the smell of the sea or the smell of the beach or the smell of the mountains. So I think for people who don't want to travel physically, Thanks to mixing the virtual and the physical world, we will, can, we will be able to give them some nice opportunities as well. Probably there will be a world hotel and every room will be one country if you want to go to... Perfect, why not? Yeah, then yeah. and the smells and then for example we come to Netherlands, that will be Amsterdam. There you come to Norway, that will be Oslo. Would be a great idea, yes. You are a very popular person for lectures to financial institutions. Why? Well, because uh, most uh, stakeholders in the financial industry only talk to economists and other financial specialists. But I am uh, talking, my knowledge is not only based on economic, uh, economic studies, it's also based on what, what, what IT is doing, what the virtual world is doing, what technology is doing, what about what, uh, milit what the military are doing. So I, I have a much broader, much broader knowledge than the, the people they usually talk to have. And they love to, that's why they love to exchange their views and their ideas with me. And then we mirror each other's uh, uh, ideas and that is not wonderful. We have, we have great discussions. I, lo I love it and they love it. How do you believe Norway can survive after the oil will be depleted? I don't think the oil will be depleted soon and Norway also has gas. Don't forget, the whole world needs oil and gas, not only for energy, but from oil. We make a lot of things. We make plastics to make computers from, cameras from, and other, other things. And we will always need oil and gas, natural gas and LNG. Don't worry, Norway can make, lot, as you see it now with a cold winter coming up in Europe, everybody needs Norwegian gas. Everybody wants Norwegian oil because we cannot survive on wind and solar. There is no sun here, there will be no winds. So we will need it. Don't worry about it. And if you invest the money and the profits that you make with oil and gas, if you invest them well, for example in food, and you're already doing it, you have, uh, you have some major companies in Norway, you have some interesting startups, but if you invest it well, you already have it with your salmon, you have your salmon farms, your fish farms in the, in the fjords, and everybody loves the Norwegian salmon. So you do, you're already doing it. And if you think more about what you can do, for example, with IT-related business, digital e-commerce, -e and with more of these things. But I'm quite sure that Norwegians, especially when they are brainstorming with other people like me and other people from around the world, will be able to come up with brilliant solutions and brilliant ideas for new business. 
In Netherlands, a lot of people using gas for cooking and warming. How do you think Norway can help Netherlands with the gas? Well, the, our Dutch government has been stupid. Uh, pretty stupid and pretty ignorant in the past 20 years. Because most of the gas in Holland was found in the northeastern part of the country. But what our government did was pumping the gas from there and all the money went to the capital, to the national government, and the people in the region got nothing. So the people became angry because, because of pumping the gas, they got earthquakes and their houses were damaged. And so the people were irritated. In England, whenever you, you try to drill for gas and oil or other things in, an, in a province or in an area, the area gets 50% of the profit and 50% goes to the national government. So people are always happy. I don't know how it is in Norway, but if the area profits from it, nobody, everybody says it's fantastic, do it, pump more, pump more, pump more. In America it's also the same. So our government has been stupid. So the northern province, the region where the gas was found, is now opposed to it being pumped. But if the government will come to a solution with them, an agreement with them, in the future they would get it. But because of politics has been quite stupid, so the situation has escalated. I think it will be very difficult to get a new compromise. So Norwegians, please, please, please help us through this winter. Help us with your gas. Export it to us. Create a, build a pipeline from Norway to Holland. Send your tankers from uh, to here. Bring LNG or whatever. Do everything. Help us and make a lot of money and make good profits of our stupidity. In 2012, you wrote a book, The End of Privacy. How do you think your predictions came true? Well, if you have a look, if you visit the new airport of Beijing, the capital of China, which is, I think it's called Daxing Airport. Daxing Airport, everywhere, everywhere, you have cameras with facial recognition. So you check in when you want to take a plane, you board, you, 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 you check in, and uh, the, they make the photo of you and scan, and everywhere you're recognized. Everywhere, whichever shop you go to, you don't have to show your, your boarding pass, you don't have to show your passport, they know where you are. What you buy, of course you buy it, whatever, everything, it is charged from your bank account. You don't even have to show your credit card, you don't have to see your debit card, it's fantastic. When you go in con conferences now in, in Beijing or also in Shanghai, also, conferences are very, very efficient. It's all, the logistics are all flowing through. It's fantastic. I love it. Of course, you have no privacy, but who cares? Who has privacy now? Facebook knows everything about people. LinkedIn knows everything about people. Apple, Samsung, they know everything about people. Who, who still believes in privacy is believing in fairy tales. Coming to China, uh, what is your book about the mega trends uh, of China that you wrote many years ago, I think. It is about how we Europeans can deal with China. What, uh, what does China want from us? What do we want from China? How can we do business with each other? And, uh, and also some of the cases uh, that we did in Holland, for example. There is this very small, uh, s uh, very small town in Holland called Giethoorn. Giethoorn is a very old-fashioned uh, Dutch city, very traditional antique city. And the Chinese love it to come there on holidays and take the boats and then, and then go and have a look around it. Giethoorn promoted itself very well in China. And this very remote city, somewhere in the north of the Netherlands, is attracting millions of Chinese tourists and the local entrepreneurs make uh, good money from that. Maybe uh, a small town in Norway could try something like that too. If you want, to, but in, for example, I think it was in Austria or Switzerland, there's also a very small town which became very famous because of one of the, the mo films of Walt Disney and then suddenly zillions of tourists started to come in. I think it was because after the movie Frozen. 
And then the, the villagers didn't like it. They said, we don't have any privacy anymore. Everybody's looking through our windows and we don't want it anymore. So it depends on if a city and if the citizens or a town, if the citizens want it or not. If you don't want it, don't do something like that because uh, there are so many people in the world. Don't forget, we are in Europe with about 560 million people. We are the richest continent in the world. But China has a middle class of 400 million people. India has a middle class of 400 million people, which did not exist in 1970. So these people now have the means to travel and they want to travel. They want to travel and for them, Europe is one big Disneyland. So yes, yes, we are the Disneyland, so that's fantastic. So let's Disney. Why China is so important in microeconomics and how it can influence Scandinavia and Netherlands? China is important, but India is important as well, because don't forget, China is aging as fast as Europe is due to the one-child policy, uh, one child policy and also to the fact that many Chinese parents only wanted a boy, so they aborted baby girls. China has a surplus today of 60 million boys. F India has the same, a surplus of 60 million boys. And uh, so what do we see in China? Many Chinese will be dead before they are rich because uh, of aging. Aging is going to cost lots and lots and lots of money. And, uh, and, uh, and India also has, has problems with that. But in, in the thing is, in India, people still make babies. India still has a quite young population, much younger than China, much younger than Europe. So we will need uh, quite a lot of Indians. Also because, don't forget, every average Indian speaks at least three or four languages. And for since Indo-European languages, the languages of India and Europe, all originate from one language. In the old, thousands and thousands of years ago, we spoke one language. And from that la language, this uh, pre-Indian European language, the, the, the European and the Indian languages derived. So the basic, the, basic of the, 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 the basic is still the same. So for them, it's easier to learn our languages than the Chinese. What do you think about Brexit? How will it influence all Europe and the world? Well, Brexit is, uh, it happened uh, because the, 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 the chemistry between Britain and Brussels was, uh, was uh, eroded. And of course, England is not far away. Great Britain is not far away. We still do a lot of business. We still do a lot of tourism with them as well. My husband works from home quite a lot in London. He's still, he's still working in London and Brexit or no Brexit, it is still one of the main financial centers of the world and, uh, and we will still do business there. And have a look, for example, at AUKUS, the new agreement, the new defense agreement between America, Australia and uh, uh, Great Britain, which is, going to, 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 which is uh, irritating the Chinese and the French, but it is working. So Great Britain was, is, was and will be able to do business with the world, Brexit or no Brexit. The world is much bigger than, uh, than that. So I don't worry about it too much. Only the British will have to learn to work again because they were used to the fact that all the work was done by immigrants and now they will have less immigrants, but a lot of immigrants did the work. What are your predictions about the cryptocurrency? I don't know the details of cryptocurrencies, but what I do know is the fact that central banks have been printing so much money in the past few years. The American Central Bank, the European one, the Japanese, and all the others followed, that a lot of people are not valuing money as they valued it in the past. and. There are a lot of people who expect that money is going to become less valuable than it is today. And in the old days, then they, they invested in gold, which they, they still do. And today they also invest in cryptos. I don't know which cryptos will survive and which will not. 
like in 1920, there were about 200 car brands in America, no, 2,000 car brands in America. And we knew the car would be automobiles, they would become big, but we didn't know which of the 2,000 brands would do it. And the same is now, yes, cryptos will be big, but we don't know which one of the current cryptos will be the, the ones who survive. I find some of them very interesting. For example, in Israel, they now have the crypto called Karat, Karat, C-A-R-A-T. That one is not launched by a bank, but is launched by the Israeli Diamond Exchange. And the word, the value of this crypto is based on the value of the diamonds in the folds of, uh, of this diamond exchange. It is fantastic. It is old world and new world brought together. And I spoke to some business people in Finland. They are now trying to create a currency based on gold. And they're buying up tons and tons of gold from South America, putting them in the vaults in Finland. And then they're going to create a new crypto based on the value of the gold in the vaults in Finland. I love that. So this, is, this whole idea of crypto is also making central banks nervous, but it's good. They should be nervous because you can't go on printing money on and on and on and on. It's ridiculous. How can cryptocurrency change the world? Cryptos can change the world. They will change the world for good and also for bad sakes. We see it, for example, with ransomware. When, um, uh, uh, when a hacker hacks a company, most of the time he wants the ransomware not in US dollars or in euros or something else. He wants it in cryptos. So that is one of the things that's going to happen. It starts with criminals, but one of the things, the, the three, um, there are some very innovative uh, uh, branches in the world. First one is the, the branch of, uh, of sex and pornography. The sex, second one is the one of security and the army and police. The third one is criminality. So these three branches are the most innovative and most creative in the world. So if the, 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 the criminals are now embracing cryptos, I'm really interested in what the rest is going to do now and how we are going to do it. What are your plans for the future? My plans for the future is for first to enjoy life. I'm an old man, I'm ancient. I have traveled so much in my life and I enjoyed it so much in my life. And so the past one and a half years I had to sit at home, which was not so much of a problem because our home is full with art from all over the world, from all the countries where we travel. So we have all the memories it's, uh, in our homes. But now I want to travel again because I think that traveling is good for people. It opens your mind, it opens your eyes, it opens your senses. So I want to travel again and I want to enjoy life. Three years ago I suffered from, a, four years ago I suffered from a stroke. Uh, so I was almost dead. Uh, this uh, summer my uh, husband suddenly uh, uh, got to know that he had lung cancer. He survived it. We both survived that. So the only thing, the most important thing for us is to enjoy life, to enjoy life as much as possible because it can end tomorrow. You can get a disease, you can get, you, or terrorists can shoot you or whatever. So enjoy life, enjoy life as much as possible. And my mother who was Hindu always told us, look, you can always believe that you reincarnate and if you're not happy in this life or it ends too early, then you can reincarnate. Hindus believe in reincarnation. But she always told us, don't come back as a chicken because then you end up in the restaurant, in a pan, in a, <laughs> served, uh, served in a restaurant. <laughs> so make it now, make it now. I enjoyed an uh, interview with you and I enjoyed spending time with you. Thank uh, you, my friend. Thank, thank you. you very much that you had time to join our interview. Wonderful. Thank you.